And the little bit just from here, I think that's uh, yeah. your, your oscillation here at the, at the beginning. Yeah. 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 Okay, then. Yes, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But, 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 but. Yeah. Or you, you, you can be there yeah, because this is for us. Yeah. 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 I understand that you don't like to, to be just in front of the other. Morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? Yes. So you take uh, today, sir. I'll take the uh, boom. As well, you, you can change when you Okay, you are, you know, you know. But you see, the, because me. Just in case, if I need to yeah, yeah, yeah. something, but if not, you take care of it. Three calls, you see that. Uh, <laughs> where is this? Uh, maybe it's <coughs> unexpected during this. All the office are there. Yeah. Just, just, I know, I don't know. Just, you see, just the first person is coming, and now we're re re expecting for the other. I send an email so to the, the lady in front of us must be the first speaker. No, no, she's the first. She's the first. You are our speaker, not? No, no. no. Just for my understanding, that's it. We, we upload just for one person. Okay? But the address and that they don't they don't show up to me. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I forgot to bring some sweeties that if I uh, that I, I, I give it to you. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know, maybe maybe give it just for your uh, for your voice. Nine sharp or sharp? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back again to this uh, session about the capacity building, education, and public awareness. Um, this is the continuation that we had yesterday, and today we'll have uh, some presentations more than that we had yesterday. Uh, just to remind you that if we have, uh, if we are a presenters for today, and you did not upload your uh, presentation, please do that. In your 
right side, in the disk, and then apply data for the, to, to be on the, on the rack. That's the first point. And then now we're going to move to the, our, our session. And the first uh, in the list uh, will be uh, Miss Elena Sivkunova. She's from, uh, wait, wait before the applause. She is from the, <laughs> the National Research and Nuclear University, Memphis. Now we can applaud. <laughs> now we have the floor. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good morning, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me kick off by introducing myself. My name is Yelena Tsivkunova. I am with the Institute of International Relations at the Nuclear University, MAFI. It is a great honor for me to represent my university today, and it is a great pleasure to speak about MAFI's capacity building project, which is aimed at nurturing science diplomacy generation to advance the CTBT. Well, uh, you may wonder why science diplomacy at the Nuclear University? Well, let us have a quick look at the sustainable development goals. The UN Agenda 2030 was adopted to address modern challenges and transform our world for the better. Without any doubt, the challenges of the 21st century have scientific dimensions. These are global problems that require concerted efforts of many countries. Take climate change, nuclear disarmament, poverty reduction, food security. So, in this respect, the nexus between science and diplomacy has become ever more crucial to deal successfully with these daunting issues. Well, uh, due to the fact that the language of science is universal, neutral, transparent, it is immune from political frictions, science can build trust and open new channels of communication between states. So, fostering science diplomacy generation is the goal of primary importance for MEFI as an educational institution. Actually, it is one of our SDGs, while well, to harness the power of atom, as it is embodied in uh, MEFI's logo, the uh, power of science with a view to nurturing science diplomacy generation. In the course of my presentation, I will provide the outline of MEFI project elaborating on its key objectives and activities. Special emphasis will be laid on science diplomacy generation to advance the CTBT. It is a cross-disciplinary course that I was in charge of. At the end of my presentation, I will recap some of the key takeaways of this English as a medium of instruction course, and then speak about the potential development of our project. So, all in all, well, uh, let us uh, begin with the key objectives. MEFI project is expected to provide opportunities for students to learn more about science diplomacy, the CTBT and its verification regime, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Secondly, the project is aimed at revitalizing the current scientific and technical members of the CYG in um, expanding CYG membership. And finally, the project is deemed to provide a platform for cross-disciplinary, multicultural and inter-institutional collaboration through various outreach and education activities that are presented on my next slide. As you can see, key project activities included students' participation in international events, education and publishing activities, successful participation in the CTBT Innovation Challenge Project, Science Diplomacy School, poster contest, presentation contest. Now I'm going to speak about these activities in detail. Uh, and let us begin with uh, outreach activities. MEFI students raised awareness of uh, the CTBT and its verification regime at youth summits, namely the second international uh, youth forum that was held in Lahore, Pakistan, the youth forum that took place in Moscow. Well, as for me, I headed for St. Petersburg and took the floor on the margins of the NATE convention, that is uh, National Association of uh, Teachers of English. 
In the course of my presentation, I stress the importance of incorporating CTBT-related topics into academic activities and curricula of Russian schools and universities. Well, uh, actually, the book that I'm, that I'm holding in my hand, it is called Science Diplomacy in Developing Citizen Activism of the Youth. That's a good result of our academic publishing activity. Eight articles in this book touch upon different aspects of the CTBT. Well, the poster contest, Say No to War, is another example of an academic activity that was very instrumental in fostering science diplomacy generation. Such contests do develop critical thinking, imagination, creativity, and actually 12 posters that you can see in this picture, they reiterate the importance of peaceful coexistence of nations and maintenance of international peace and security. The same topic was one of the agenda items of the first science diplomacy school. While the school serves as a good example of inter-institutional collaboration, we'll just have a look at the statistics. 30 participants from Moscow, St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk, Samara, representing different universities. Actually, the total number was 15 universities. Experts from MEFI, MGIMO, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, Peer Center, Russian International Affairs Council, Gorchikov fa Fund, Gorbachev Fund shared their knowledge with the uh, participants. On the sidelines of the school, web conferences were arranged with the participation of the CTBTO experts. And I should say a very inspiring discussion was held on women in peace and security with the representatives of Arms Control Association, Nuclear Threat Initiative, Middlebury Institute of International Studies, and the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. All in all, a very insightful and unforgettable experience. And now we've come to education activities. First of all, a few words about CYG-led course, science, uh, the CTBT, the cornerstone of nuclear security. The course was uh, conducted twice, and actually uh, that was a five-week interactive course uh, which was aimed at raising awareness of the CTBT and its verification regime. And I should say that it was very instrumental in expanding CYG membership at MAFI. And secondly, a 15-week cross-disciplinary course, Science Diplomacy Generation to Advance the CTBT, which serves as a good example of English as a medium of instruction course, when English is not the mother tongue of the students. Well, um, I should say that was quite unique experience for MAFI and for me personally. 16 students of different majors from Russia, Japan, France, attended classes and participated in various activities that formed an integral part of the course. Well, as an example, an on-site visit to NEVAD, MEFI unique scientific facility, just was also incorporated into the syllabus of the course. One of our tasks was to prepare participants for successful professional communication. In this contest, Web conferences were arranged with the CTBTO experts. Uh, a very interesting discussion on the achievements and challenges of the international monitoring system with the director of the CTBTO IMS division, Mrs. Nochen Morello Zell, who shared her knowledge on science and technology with MAFI students. And a very informative lecture followed by a Q&A session with the director of the CTBTO on-site division, Mr. Vadim Smirnov, who spoke about the nuts and bolts of the CTBTO on-site inspections. Well, finally, we've come to the presentation contest that was uh, a very important, that it played a very important role in the final assessment of the students' participation. Eight presentations were evaluated by the members of the jury who represented different institutions, namely Duhov of Russia Institute of Automatics, 
the Center for Energy and Security Studies, MEFI, and the CTBTO, who was, which was represented by the CYG uh, Regional Coordinator for Eastern Europe. Uh, the participants of the presentation contest attempted to investigate the potential linkages between the CTBT and um, pollution of cities, climate change, uh, gender equality, uh, quality education. And uh, I'm really happy to see the winner of our presentation contest, Xenia, and other participants of our presentation contest, Lera, uh, Raman, Vadim, just uh, Maria, Sofia, who are presenting their projects and posters on the sidelines of the uh, CTB Science and Technology Conference. So, at the end of my presentation, let me recap and share with you some of the key takeaways of uh, this course, English is a Medium of Instruction course. First of all, uh, EMI courses should be underpinned by a communicative method and a cross-disciplinary approach when it comes to tasks design. So role plays, discussions, team building activities are very much encouraged in a learning process, especially when English is not the mother tongue of the students. Secondly, the use of authentic materials is a must, especially when it comes to listening and reading uh, comprehension. And thirdly, regular progress checks are desirable. As uh, we say, trust but verify, just a very famous Russian proverb provides. So word lists with questions for comprehension, checks with reflective questions were very, very beneficial and are beneficial in a learning process when, again, just I will repeat it, English is not the mother tongue of the students. All in all, we are planning to provide the uh, just development of uh, our project. So personally, I'm going to introduce some changes and improvements into the EMI course. Besides, we are planning to develop web-based course materials, both in English and in Russian, from uh, elementary to advanced levels, and hopefully in uh, academic cooperation with the CTBTO. Last but not least, Presentation Contest 2020, Science Diplomacy School 2020 have been already scheduled in our um, upcoming uh, academic year. And uh, the development of MEFI Science Diplomacy Club is also one of our top priorities. Well, I am a teacher by training, and I wholeheartedly believe that Education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change our world for the better. On my final slide, you can see two very, very symbolic images. The first picture depicts a tasty cake with many fruits and a logo of Mephi Science Diplomacy Club. By the way, that's a real picture of a mouth-watering cake that we all enjoyed at our final session of Mephi Science Diplomacy Club in May. In the second picture, you can see my former student, Natasha, who just helped me implement many CTBT-related projects. So now she is the CYG Regional Coordinator for uh, Eastern Europe. So when united, these pictures symbolize a cordial handshake of fruitful cooperation between different institutions and different generations in the attainment of common ends, that is, nurturing science diplomacy generation to advance the CTBT. Thank you very much for your kind attention and your questions and comments are more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for a very nice presentation and very clear uh, now the floor is open for everybody if you want to ask your question or comments. Before we actually move on, we want to make sure that the next speaker is not here. So if, if the next speaker is here, let us know. If not, we use the next, next 15 minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Okay, maybe yeah. just so. 
during the coffee break. Well, uh, those who are interested in our MAFI project will just approach me and just we will discuss it during our coffee break. Okay, thank you very much. I have one question. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, just a little, um, I don't know if, if it's a question or concern, because you see, uh, as I understand, Russia is one of the state that who ratified the, the, the treaty. Yes, uh, of course. Of course. Well, and by the way, um, no, 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 no. Let, let, let me finish what I, I, I would like to go. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have some uh, states that, for example, France, Japan, also that uh, you train there. But uh, how do you? Well, what, what's your plan to reach the other countries who not ratify the, 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 the treaty? Through this, uh, I think, uh, through this uh, tool, to this very uh, powerful tool, how can we reach the, the other uh, countries? Okay, thank you for your question. So, well, um, just a few words about Russia's ratification of the CTBT. Well, at the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that I'm with the Institute of International Relations, MAFI. And, um, just our institute is celebrating the 20th anniversary this year, mm -hmm. so we are a little bit younger than the CTBT, just uh, 20 years old. And you see when uh, the Institute of International Relations was established, that was an initiative of a very prominent Russian diplomat, Evgeny Primokov, right. who in 1996 signed the CTBT on behalf of the Russian Federation. Exactly. So while well, Russia was like one of the first countries, they just signed and then just ratified this agreement. That's the first part of the question. So uh, why did we have students from Japan and France while well, attending the lessons, the, the, just uh, the classes of this very course? Well, uh, it is important to create a multicultural communication between students because when you discuss international problems, by the way, um, we do not have, uh, in a modern world, we do not have problems, we have challenges, okay? That's a kind of a little shift from pl problems to challenges. So it is important to create this multicultural communication and make English as a medium of instruction. Learn students how to find common grounds, ground with uh, the representatives of different countries, uh, let them be engaged in a constructive dialogue, forge consensus and just uh, work out different new methods how to deal with those daunting challenges. And by the way, the students who attended the lessons, they were not aware of the CTBT, by the way. Okay, for them it was a kind of like a, um, a revelation or whatever, so they uh, just learned a lot mm -hmm. and uh, I'm pretty sure that just uh, they will uh, just continue spreading, proliferating the knowledge of the CTBT in their countries and just other communities of students. Mm -mm. Okay. Comments or questions? Yeah. Um, oh, the micro. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Ksenia and I'm happy to be part of the Science Diplomacy Generation projects and to, uh, together with Ms. Sofkanova, we organize a lot of those events that she mentioned. And I wanted to make a comment about your question concerning participation of students from Annex to States. Um, so Ms. Sofkanova said that we're going to, we're going to have a school, uh, Science Diplomacy School 2020 next year. And uh, this time it was just among Russian students, but next time we want to make it international and invite students also from Annex to States and also implement the idea of CTBD to them. So this was like a little comment on your question because Annex to States and students from that right. place. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because me, I'm thinking about that the, the philosophy of that, what behind of this, okay, but uh, no, I have some clear ideas. Thanks so much. I think that now it's time for us to move on to the, for the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the second that was supposed to be here is uh, Kazmi, but uh, she or he, he did not show up. And then we move to the third one, Ishmuharto. Okay. Um, he's here. He's here. He's here. 
And he said, okay. I think that the name is from Indonesia. Yes. Okay, welcome. <laughs> You can. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rambola Manana, Mr. Yim as the chairperson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everybody. <coughs> uh, I want to uh, present my ideas. Just um, um, it's I got it pro by my experience. To uh, when I involved in nuclear activity in Indonesia, uh, I'm in chairman of INSUF. Indonesia Nuclear for Sustainable Benefit Promotor. Uh, as everybody know, uh, the Indonesian, uh, the Indonesia have no power plant, nuclear power plant. Uh, <coughs> and what Indonesia people what Indonesian people know about nuclear, mostly about disaster, sometimes about war. Uh, or when when I talk to everybody, I ask them, I ask them, uh, what do you know about nuclear? And then they usually said, oh, it's a bomb. Yes. Uh, Many, many people of Indonesia knowing nuclear uh, so limited like that. Uh, but another people, uh, they know um, when the student or, or academic people know knowing nuclear is about knowledge. So uh, there are no reason to be a priori to any knowledge. So uh, some people in Indonesia uh, raise the, their ability to, to pursue the nuclear capability. Uh, and, and the others. <laughs> but in, for every modern people, uh, common people, common modern people, they usually think that nuclear is business. That's about big, big business. So uh, that was why some uh, big businessmen in Indonesia uh, shifting their their business from. Uh, conventional business to nuclear business, uh, like uh, when uh, we have uh, news newspaper media, uh, uh, Mr. Dahlan is kind of switching from uh, newspaper to nuclear business because they know that nuclear is a big business, but. <coughs> Ah. Come, <clears throat> uh, Indonesia st stand from 260 million people. They were, uh, they have 1,300 cultural entity. So the culture uh, will, will make um, 
very, very influence to how decision maker uh, will will make a decision but Indonesia going to nuclear or not going to nuclear country. <clears throat> but we need nuclear so much because we have 17 and 17,504 islands. We are, have uh, many, many remote area. We need uh, a power plant that can produce energy to uh, all Indonesian territory. <clears throat> so, why culture? Uh, why we have to, why we should uh, raising the nuclear awareness for the people across culture. A culture determine how the people knowing the paradigm, delivering the message or understanding the knowledge. So uh, when, <clears throat> when we can uh, activate the culture to involving, to raising the nuclear uh, awareness. Uh, it must be, I think, uh, when I, I, I can give you example in Indonesia. Uh, in West of Indonesia, uh, in Minang, uh, Minang culture, uh, the opinion, the decision making, should be uh, very, very <coughs> dipengaruhi apa ya? Uh, and, uh, um, contribute by by woman, woman opinion in uh, Minang culture, but in in the other side of Indonesia in Papua. Uh, Decision making is only get by the chief of the cultural entity. Uh, the, uh, they don't they don't uh, elaborate from the from the people how how they they want something, but <clears throat> just only. Uh, the chief of the cultural entity have the voice, and the voice uh, mean the people voice. That what happened in uh, east of Indonesia, but they have uh, in Indonesian state uh, all of the cultural entity must be uh, have the contribution. So between the, uh, among the different culture we have to we have to uh, get them all we have to we have to hurt them all hurt the, all the voice and then uh, articulating as a national uh, national program that's uh, in Indonesia. Uh, I'm sorry for my bad English. So, uh, <clears throat> so what said? Uh, that's um, from Indonesia, and we we know that the in the global global preference, there are many. Uh, in Indonesia, one one thousand and three hundred cultural uh, cultural entities, and I'm sure that in the global must be many many thousand more. So, when the preference between one and the others is different, it must be so hard to to make a conclusion to make a, a the same 
same uh, willing to to achieve the goal. <coughs> With sufficient sufficient knowledge about nuclear benefit and threat, uh, people will play major role in the development and global network for peaceful nuclear peaceful nuclear use and active the supervision of potential nuclear uh, for war purpose. Especially for the nuclear test ban. Uh, so we 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 are hope that <coughs> um, it not just a scientific matter or uh, um, economic matter but the nuclear test ban is about cultural matter. So, um, with, with the contribution will be effective when, <coughs> when CTBTO work together with local institution of the culture uh, entity. Um, I'm sorry, that's all I mean. <laughs> I'm sorry for, for my limited presentation and I'm open for you if you have any question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to, so much to Mr. Ismuharto. Yes. Now the floor is open to you uh, for any questions or remark. Uh, yes. Question. Mystery. So is there um, any public poll or data about the level of interest in nuclear power in Indonesia or the perception of the public regarding nuclear weapons or banning nuclear weapon tests? Uh, data about any data public yeah. surveys uh, i'm i'm not getting the the data but but the uh, last last year we have a survey about that and the preferences is uh, showing that uh, acceptance about nuclear, when they know what nuclear is, is high. But when they, when they don't know about uh, the benefits of nuclear, they always know nuclear is disaster. That's all. That, so uh, everybody, when, when, when they never uh, involved to, to uh, nuclear people or, or they're not educated about nuclear, they always rejected everything about nuclear. But they are always, always uh, accept when they know that nuclear is about energy, is about uh, medicine and others. Mm. I think that's it. <clears throat> yeah, Remy. My name is Remy. Yes. What I wanted to ask about is uh, uh, looking at the map that you gave us, uh, you said there are about 17,000 plus uh, islands. Yes. And then you are advocating for uh, the nuclear power for such a scattered country, meaning that uh, transporting that power to all those islands will be a challenge. W yeah. What challenges do you face with those who advocate for renewable energy? in terms of energy aspect of the nuclear power? Ah, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm not talking about nuclear, uh, only uh, uranium reactor, because we have friends uh, doing an experiment to, to make a battery from the uh, waste of uh, material, uh, you know, thorium material, the waste is uh, going to be uh, PU to 38, that it, it uh, will be uh, battery material. So 
uh, I'm advocate the nuclear power. Uh, I built a nuclear reactor in the big island, but in the remote island, we can use the the waste uh, the byproduct uh, battery. So. Uh, Last night, I um, discussed with, with uh, some, um, one participant from Philippines. Uh, uh, he, he asked me, he, he said, I'm, I'm unfair, unfair because uh, I'm advocate the nuclear, but I'm not uh, advocate the, the technology of uh, renewable. Uh, I know the renewable power uh, have many, many activities, many activists. So uh, we, we, we're talking each other, but the nuclear have a big, big barrier in Indonesia. So that's why I advocate the nuclear matter in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay, I think that we are now on, on time for this. And then let's move to the next uh, presentation. Thank you. And thanks so much to you, Mr. Uh, Ismaharto from you. Indonesia. Thank you so much. Applause to him. The next one, I think that it's uh, from the University of Nagasaki University, uh, Mrs. Uh, Wynn. I've seen her before. She dis disappeared. Hey. <laughs> five minutes, actually. You have five minutes. So uh, I think just to remind you that if uh, there is someone in the, in the room who has a presentation for today, please raise up and bring it to the, uh, the desk over there. We are expecting Mr. Rabiu. Abduharaman, Mrs. McBee. You are not in the, the room? Oh, I think the session, the, I mean the speaker is expected to speak at 9.45, so I think we should we should wait a few minutes. So that we have to short the... <laughs> Where is she? Hey. And then we have one here, Miss Wynn. The third presenter will be Miss Wynn. She's from the Nakazaki University. Uh, she's going to talk about the raising public awareness among students about CDBT in this new nuclear age. Hello, everyone. My name is Win uh, from Myanmar. Currently, I'm studying master programs in Nagasaki University and about disaster and radiation biomedical science. And, and also, I am CDBT youth group member and coordinator for South Asia and Pacific for, and Far East. Okay, today, today I would like to present something about uh, what I have done in uh, Cambodia, what I have done in Myanmar, and also in Japan Nagasaki University. Okay. So, whenever I I introduce myself. Okay, I'm from Myanmar. Some people, may, some people know us like because uh, they know our sensitivity, and some people don't know who, who, where, where is that. So <laughs> I got idea that I want to uh, mention my country a uh, map in there, and so my my country, borders countries are India and China, Laos, Thailand. So. Uh, we are very big land countries. Uh, some people, they know us as uh, Burma, but now we call Myanmar. OK. 
Okay. So, uh, Myanmar signed CDBD on uh, 1996 after two months only, and ratifying on September 2016, on 21 September 2016. And so in, in this presentation, you know, in, in Myanmar, like a developing country, we, we don't even know what is CDBD and what they are doing. Uh, for me, luckily, I met one CDBD youth group uh, member, Maggie, uh, last two years ago, and then she introduced me what CDBD youth groups are doing and that. So I became a member in CDBD youth group. and. As a developing country, my country is not uh, very active. I mean, we are doing for peaceful purposes in a nuclear application, but not in other ways. Even an application, nuclear application, we do only in medical fee and agriculture fee. And so this is this a slide showing that um, I am nuclear engineer student, so. I do. I did some uh, rising awareness about CDBD uh, with my friends, also in university, uh, in technological university in Myanmar. So, uh, in the pictures, uh, all are my friends. Uh, they are doing. They are also government officer in university, and we took that discussion uh, in some restaurant. Uh, because you know, in in univer if we want to do university, we have to ask some, a lot of inform, a lot of uh, you know, uh, a permission from governments, a lot of things. We need to go, a lot of stuff. So, uh, what I can do is uh, just only with my friend, who who can afford to sit with water. <laughs> we don't we don't order anything, just with water and then uh, we just discard because they wish to, they really willing to know what is C D B D is going on and they don't even know before or C D B D they didn't even hear what is C D B D O. So um, I was discard about C D B D or what they have done and what they are doing, what they have to do. Um, in, in, this is in Myanmar uh, with uh, nuclear engineering students. Also, I have a nuclear engineering Facebook group. Uh, so I share all information, which is uh, our opportunity uh, for young people. Uh, I share in that group, and also they know uh, CDBD, how they, they can, uh, uh, CDBD, how they can provide young people uh, to get uh, new opportunities. Uh, and then I did one, uh, not, yeah, one discussion in Cambodia among international students in Cambodia uh, pa from Panyastra University in Cambodia. So, and then also currently I'm studying in Nagasaki University, so I I did uh, some discussion about CDBT uh, with uh, nuclear. Uh, um, Radiation and Dicester Medical Science students, uh, PhD or my, my master degree students in Japan. And that is what I have done. And this is the aim and objective what I would like to do uh, from, my, uh, from my activities. And whenever Whenever we discuss with my friends and my group, I always mention that uh, that e CDBD or interactive e-learning platform, and so we can know exactly what CDBD is going on, uh, how, uh, what they are doing, and and in Myanmar, <laughs> why I put only these two? Uh, because a lot of challenge in Myanmar, like developing country, I don't want to put a lot of things. But the important thing is, you know, in university, we don't have um, supporting material, even uh, even like in lab, they, we don't have, uh, okay, I am nuclear engineering student, but I didn't have chance to measure any uh, radiation. I didn't have chance to touch a dosimeter or other uh, measuring instrument. So, it, so in for C, for if I want to share CDBD or so I just 
uh, mentioned before e-learning platform so they can know what uh, is going on and then and then we ask we are from developing countries, so we need a lot of inspiration. We we are losing hope. We don't know what we what we can do in the future. We because we live more than 60 years in the close policy. So uh, why why are the people, our young young generations, are doing other things and finding new technology and they improving their side? They know how they go their way, but for us, we don't know how we can go. After nuclear, after we study nuclear engineer, what we can do, we don't know. So <laughs> we don't have chance. We don't have job too. So so we need inspiration. Uh, so here is a one. Uh, yesterday from CD video, a youth group they published one inspiring story. Uh, it's about me. So why I mentioned this one because from this post, from this post, uh, a lot of students from. Uh, Myanmar, a uh, nuclear engineering student, and new generation, they are all motivated. Oh, they, they knew that oh, how they can do. I, uh, so I, am, I, I hope I give motivation to them. So they are very active now, and then they say that, okay, she's doing this thing, okay, we do, you know, when we, after we choose nuclear engineer, we just think that we have no job after graduation, uh, we have nothing to do in Myanmar, and, but at least uh, we, I find a way where, where, can, where, where I can participate, you know. So, so I really thanks to CD video to uh, post uh, this, uh, this um, uh, post, and so people know what, we are, what I am doing, what they can do uh, in, in, my, in my country. And this is uh, my university. Um, all, sir, all students are boys, just few people, few students are girls. Yeah. And this is my country. So that's all. <laughs> my presentation is just about rising awareness about CDBT, about engineering, nuclear engineering students, and students in developing countries. So. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> if you have any question, please. Okay, for any questions? Yes. We have time because yeah. we have just one presentation after this. Yes. Yeah, Rim. Yes. Um, I, I, it's both for you and her. I, I, I don't know if there is an NDC in Myanmar. Not yet. Yes. Not yet. Not yet well est established. You are still established. Because uh, I'm thinking about uh, the CBS to be installed there. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. And then following that, that, that we can do for them not to, to bring data to them. Okay. And then they, she can use the data from the IMS, the Internet of Light data on that. Okay. This ID. Because there is one person from Myanmar who's coming many times to the CTPTO for training. Okay. And th she is at the second, I think that following the training cycle that we established uh, yes, yes. La since last year, uh, she's not the second step, I think so. Okay. 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 And uh, you have to be in, in touch with this person or to, to me directly. Uh, sorry? You have to be in touch with this person from your country or. Ah, yes, yeah, so because they are from government center, you know, uh, government center, they have a lot of policy, they are doing this, easy, and then they took too much time. I mean, I, I'm doing this presentation because, you know, I just sharing that what young people can do, and I want, I want advice from the people what we can continue, you know. Yep. Um, of course, government, they, uh, they also want to help to students a lot, but I don't, I don't know what policy is going on there. <laughs> I mean, I don't want but to unfortunately know. Unfortunately, for the city B2, yes. we have this approach between yeah. the government, official yeah. government and Yes, yes. CBTO. Yes, I know, I know. But uh, I am just focusing rising awareness on just on students. You yeah. know, I used to work at, in government center two, for two years, uh, but I resigned my job. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't remember the, the name. She was here yesterday. Uh, uh, let, let, let me just follow up. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Excuse me, let me just follow on. 
Um, the, the advice I would give you is that uh, yes. um, despite being in a quasi-government institution, the university yes. that you are affiliated to, I think you still can yes. be uh, affiliated to the CTBTO as an establishment mm -hmm. which could be registered for um, access to data and uh, also um, products. Yes. Then also training, as he has said. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it will be more structured that way because you know more about yeah. what the CTPTO is about. Okay. Okay. As authorized or regular users of the data that we can share to you. Yeah, yeah. You can do that yes. easily. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Nurchan? Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Marjan, and I'm CTBTO Youth Group member from Kazakhstan. Um, thank you for the nice presentation about uh, students raise awareness in Myanmar. Uh, and I have two questions. So yes. first of all, uh, what about the interest in nuclear science and nuclear engineering in your country? Yes. Uh, and uh, the second question about the gender aspect, since you are already a woman in science, are there many young women interested in uh, nuclear engineering? And for example, in the university where you studied, can you tell us more about um, the statistics probably? Is it 50-50 or is it less? Mm -hmm. And are you also doing some work in this direction in engaging more uh, young women uh, in the science? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And um, in nuclear, we, uh, you know, we always, in my country, if you, ch nobody know we have nuclear, I mean, nobody know means the outside, only children, we, when we have to choose we, uh, which, which major is priority, uh, most of the students, they choose civil architectures and other, other free, uh, which I, we can get a job easily, I mean, if you compare with nuclear engineering, and so people think uh, if you choose nuclear engineering, okay, you will, you will make bombs and then you will be sitting inside the block building and then uh, you cannot go outside uh, without permission, I mean, inside the building. So that is what my father say that, said that to me. So you don't have to, you, sh you, you should not sh choose nuclear engineering, you can choose other civil engineers or uh, architecture, some, something that you can do. So that is uh, the perspective how people think nuclear engineering, I mean, in pu from public. And so for students, uh, for, gender, for gender balance, and most of the students are boys, and men, uh, males. And for, uh, when, when I started first year in university, uh, we have only four students are a female female students in in the classroom. So and final years, I I am the one who left in this room. Everybody <laughs> leave from the <laughs> university, and then uh, they find they change their majors, and then they choose other different. Because we know that uh, we w we will not get a job after, you know. That is the point because uh, we in Myanmar important is food <laughs> that we we cannot uh, we have to. Uh, uh, you, we have to do <coughs> work for many, so that is their choice. But yeah, <laughs> but I, I'm lucky that um, from my ministry, uh, minister select me as a uh, as a candidate to vi uh, to uh, to study in Malaysia in final years. So. After, after that, I, I got some idea and then I got many connection and relation to continue uh, my career. So that is what I have done. Thank you. Thank, I think that uh, we'll stop it here now for this presentation. And let's move to the next one. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Win. So our next speaker will be from Niger. Uh, Mr. Labiu. The title of his talk will be Role of Civil Society Organizations for Education and Public Awareness. Good morning, Chatisans. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am uh, Mr. Malam Isarabiu. I come from civil society community. I am an electrical engineer. I am the representative of civil society organization in the scientific and advisory technical committee of our high authority of atomic energy in Niger. I am also a member of subcommittee communication and stakeholder involvement uh, of the National Technical Committee of uh, National Power Program, which we are implemented. So my presentation is divided into two main parts. Firstly, we see the place of civil society organization in public awareness and education. Secondly, the role that this civil society organization can play in disseminating CTBTO's values through advocacy, awareness role, education, information, and monitoring policies. Firstly, I want to remind Niger is uh, a West African country between Algeria and Libya in the north and Nigeria in the south. It's a very big country. Uh, in this country, the emergence of civil society organization is linked to the deepening of democracy and integral multi-party system. Civil society organizations are characterized by their dynamism and their diversity of action. In that, they intervene in all sectors of human life, going from the defense of human rights to the promotion of development through the fight of corruption and inequality. So, what roles can civil society organization can play in disseminating CTBTO's values? Civil society organization can play important roles in disseminating CTBTO's values, such as advocacy, information, education, and monitoring roles of policy evaluation of the values promoted by the organization. the role of advocacy. And this is to advocate to our authorities the strict application of texts that prohibit the acquisition of weapons and all nuclear technologies for non-civilian usages. This advocacy may concern the application of international and the regional legal instruments ratified by our country such as the Pelindaba Treaty, which makes Africa a zone free of nuclear weapons. Awareness role. This involves raising awareness on issues related to testing and or acquisition of nuclear weapons. This awareness raising action consists to create a synergy of actions of civil society actors for non-proliferation to encourage the citizens of Niger on building peace, to disseminate all legal instruments ratified by Niger on the subject, and to organize conferences and debates on non-proliferation. The role of education. In this regard, civil society organizations will undertake extensive education campaigns on treaties with strategies that of long-term type to different target groups for strengthening the capacities of local elected representatives, traditional leaders, religious leaders, civil society actors, magistrates, employees, and workers in general. For accompanying the commitment of the head of state to achieve a complete ban of 
nuclear weapons. The role of information. The goal is to gather all the useful information and to give them to the various actors intervening on the topic to enable actors to act acknowledgely. This recharge can be done through the perception studies that the civil society organization can be carried out on the field. The compilation of texts and conventions, the publication of posters and the animations of the of debates on the subject. Role of monitoring and evaluation. Civil society organizations can empower themselves to monitor and evaluate public policies in the implementation of non-proliferation treaties, such as evaluate the progress made on the commitments contained in the treaties, or to analyze implementation plans to identify difficulties and find solutions. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, for development on peaceful basis. Thank you very much. Any questions for our speaker? Yes, gentleman in the back. Sorry. Thank you, Malamisa. Um, question would be, how challenging, uh, difficult, or if you wish, dangerous, okay. is your role, you know, in Niger? Uh, second question would be funding. How are you funded, and how does funding availability or the lack of funding, you know, affect your your work? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by the second question. Yeah. Funding, there are some bilateral or multilateral cooperation that are funding civil society organization, like uh, Japanese cooperation. French cooperation, USA cooperation, are funding civil society organizations in playing their, in their roles. Uh, the second question is the challenge. The challenge is uh, very wide because if you want to disseminate something that uh, population is not is a very big challenge to to have all what you want to go to them. We have a challenge of uh, all concerning nuclear. People, population are ignorant of uh, nuclear. Uh, if you talk to nuclear, all the, the population seem weapons, was and everything. This, all this, they are challenges. So the work that we, we are doing is the civilian application of nuclear science. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. How do you recruit your member, and what would be the typical background of, of your members? Thank you. There is no specific background to be a member of civil society organization. It's just your engagement. So everybody can be a member of civil society organization. There is no criteria. Thank you very much. So if I may, so how was this civil society organization uh, first started? Is there any government support or government initiative, or is it just purely uh, voluntary activities by the citizens? What is the relationship between these activities with the government? Any of those, if you can shed some light. 
there is no an amount asked, but there are some documents that you will uh, you will bring to the authorities in order to have the authorization to create a, a civil society organization. There so is we, we will, I mean, how do we run the program? Is there funding coming from government, or you raise funding from the public participation? Funding can come from the members first, and the activity that you are carrying out. So it's a voluntary contribution? Yes, it's a voluntary contribution. Mm. Thank you very much. You have one more question over there. Yeah. Sorry, just to ask practically, um, do you have any example of um, an instance where your activities actually made a difference? You know, maybe a story of something that wouldn't have been except for the work that you are doing. Just if you do. Thank you. We are implementing projects for to electrify rural localities. This is one of our jobs. And we are advocating for to take account of uh, the population poverty in all our uh, policies. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's a little early, but if the, the, the people in this session agree, we'll move to the next one, our final presentation of the session. Uh, the, the speaker is Ms. McBee from Federal Federation of American Scientists. The title of her talk is The Intrinsic Value of CTBTO Workshops, Training Programs, and Expert Meetings. Ms. McBee, she doesn't have a PowerPoint, so she will sit down and then casually talk about what she wants to talk about. Well, good morning. Uh, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Zerbo and the CTBTO for inviting me to speak here. And uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Jennifer Mackby, and I handled the negotiations of the CTBT in Geneva and then came here to work on the working group on verification uh, at the CTBTO. Uh, I also direct a CTBT international coalition that includes members from all but one of the eight remaining for entry into force. So I came in at the tail end of the last presentation and was interested to hear that uh, funding, of course, is a problem. <laughs> um, so I'm going to speak about the uh, training programs, workshops, and expert meetings of the CTBTO organization. Uh, I think very few people know about it. I didn't know a whole lot myself. But over the years since 1999, the CTBTO PTS has been providing training courses, workshops, expert meetings, and capacity building to the staff of the national data centers, IMS station operators, analysts in the international data center, as well as on-site inspectors within the mandate of the treaty. The events are geared to qualified as scientific and technical experts designated by state signatories. The training programs and workshops are extensive. In 2019 alone, some 45 plan training courses, workshops, and exercises were planned by the uh, PTS, and I think very few people know about them. The training sessions provide hands-on training and practical lessons to station operators on the operation, maintenance, and repair of equipment at the IMS facilities and practical experience in an analyzing seismic infrasound, hydroacoustic, waveform, and radionuclide data. For example, the radionuclide sessions train in the use of standard software packages for pr processing and analysis of particulate and noble gas radionuclide data, as well as processing and atmospheric transport modeling output. 
The PTS capacity building and training program fo focuses on providing technical assistance to state signatories to enab enable their per participation in the verification regime of the CTBT. The word capacity does not appear in the treaty. However, the treaty does say, for example, that the functions of the technical secretariat include providing technical assistance in the installation and operation of monitoring stations. So the CTBTO PREPCOM aims to help state signatories fulfill their commitments by enhancing their technical capability to receive, process, and analyze IMS data and national da at a national data center. Capacity building in the organization also aims to increase the participation of developing countries in the technical work of the CTBTO PREPCOM and instill a sense of ownership among the members of the organization. The ultimate goal of the training is to prepare the NDCs to act as technical advisors to their respective national authorities. There has also been growing interest in regional training as well as a train the trainers in the PTS. Generally, the PTS selects nominated experts for training programs on the basis of experience and area of expertise with due regard to geographical uh, representation, diversity and gender, and subject to the availability of funding. The training courses help to show the technical experts how to work in challenging remote locations, sometimes with an unreliable power grid, possible security programs, and in harsh climate conditions. In order to meet the requirements for data availability, which is, for example, 98% for the seismic stations, and that's a pretty high bar, I think you'll agree, uh, they must minimize the downtime of the stations. These seismic stations are usually installed in remote locations in order to limit the background noise from traffic or populated areas, so it's important for the station operators to be well trained to know how to repair or replace critical components without requiring support from the CTBTO headquarters in Vienna. The challenges are even more robust for on-site inspections because of the logistics involved with moving and setting up around 100 tons of equipment including tents, portable laboratories, and analysis equipment in distant, isolated locations. So training in such environments is crucial. Another challenging factor has been the diversity in the technical background of trainees. This has been met partially by encouraging trainees to complete a number of e-learning modules before undergoing class training. There are three main categories of events li linked to capacity building, training, workshops, and conferences. So the first one, training, includes NDC training, IMS station operator training, IDC analyst training, and e-learning. The second one, workshops, includes NDC workshops, regional NDC development workshops and training, uh, national seminars, IMS technical technology workshops, and technical meetings. The third, conferences are meant to integrate diplomats, station operators, and data users to exchange knowledge with the broader scientific community, academia, and the media. The capacity building system started in 2009 to enable NDCs to install, receive, and send data to and from the IDC. And this system has helped about 63 NDCs to provide servers, computers, and so forth to uh, in emerging countries so that they can use data and products. The PTS also runs a maintenance system and has upgraded at least eight stations so far. These activities are supported from the budget of the Preparatory Commission, and periodic evaluation and monitoring is conducted on the trainings and workshops. Some basic uh, and advanced training courses are held in Vienna, and others in the field, such as the regional ones held in French, Arabic, or Spanish. For example, there will be an NDC training course in Spanish in 2021. There are six or seven training courses in the NDC per year, uh, and about 70 par participants uh, participate outside of Vienna each year, 100 participants in Vienna. And workshops include around 200 participants each year just to give you a general scope of, uh, of the size of these. Regional workshops with integrated training typically include around 30 participants. The PTS also conducts an operation and maintenance workshop every three to four years. 
that brings together station operators from all IMS technologies to share experiences and challenges. They focus on the key performance indicator, which is data availability. At the end of 2018, 322 certified IMS facilities and noble gas systems were in IDC operations. So far, there are 136 secure signatory accounts with almost 2,000 authorized users who have access to IMS data and NDC products. Well, or sorry, IDC products. While access has increased in developing countries, some 48 out of 184 countries still do not have access to IMS data and IDC products. And some 24 countries have access to the data but don't make very much use of it. So there are still some gaps, especially in less developed countries in Africa and Southeast Asia, for example. And the PTS plans to focus its capacity building on those countries. As I mentioned, in 2019, the PTS expects to co conduct around 45 training courses, workshops, and technical and expert meetings, including, for example, a workshop on co progressive commissioning, 12 training courses for staff of NDCs, nine technical trainings for station operators, three NDC regional workshops, four workshops, uh, for example, one on radionuclide laboratories, uh, five technical meetings and two expert meetings. Uh, turning to OSI, on-site inspection, which interests me quite a lot because uh, this was one area that was really left for Vienna to iron out all the details. Uh, it's a very complex area of the treaty, uh, so a lot of it has been elaborated here in Vienna. As you likely know, an on-site inspection cannot be conducted until entry into force. However, in anticipation of that event, the PTS conducts training courses, workshops, and maintains a roster of trained on-site inspectors so that upon entry into force, the training program can be adopted by the first conference of states parties. The PTS regularly tests procedures and techniques in field experiments and simulation exercises in preparing for OSI operational readiness. An on-site inspection is a complex endeavor that involves up to 40 experts deployed to search for signs of a fresh nuclear explosion within six days from receiving the inspection request. They use up to 17 different OSI techniques from visual inspections on the ground to overflights magnetic field mapping, and in extreme cases, drilling. Contrary to the IAEA and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the CTBT does not provide for a standing inspectorate. Instead, it will rely on a roster of member state experts who undergo training by the CTBTO and are available to participate in an OSI at short notice. So the PTS has been conducting these training courses since 1999, and many experts have acquired varying degrees of expertise in the techniques involved. As of early 2016, the PTS had trained 100 surrogate inspectors. The training cycle lasts for three and a half years, and inspectors who complete it are added to the roster. Candidates need to be experts in subjects related to OSI activities and techniques. Uh, just to clarify, the three and a half years is obviously not a constant, continuous course. It's just a number of days in, in each year. Currently, there are 92 surrogate inspectors on the active roster, and by the end of 2020, the PTS expects that another 84 will be added to the roster. The long-range plan foresees the need for a roster of up to 400 trained inspectors in order to maintain operational readiness after entry into force. Training activities are organized in structured cycles and consist of an introductory course, separate advanced courses on specific techniques, and tabletop simulation exercises. There are five types of technical training courses, seismic, non-seismic, geophysical techniques, radionuclide and noble gas techniques, visual observation techniques, and overflight techniques. In addition, there are training blocks on health, safety and security, rapid deployment, launch, pre-launch, post-inspection phase, and also leadership skills. And the PTS, as you may know, has conducted two very large-scale exercises, one in Kazakhstan and one very large one in Jordan in 2014. 
The smaller ones uh, focus on specific aspects such as training for the launch phase of an OSI. In 2018, South Africa hosted an advanced course and a ground and airborne based visual observation course. They trained experts in overflight techniques for an airborne observation, including the use of new equipment for visual observation and position finding. Seventy participants took part from 44 countries. And as you might know, South Africa has more IMS stations than any other country in Africa. Uh, the budget for the OSI training for 2019 is almost $2 million, which gives you a rough idea. I had a hard time finding the budget for the other training courses, but for OSI, it's about $2 million. Uh, just as an interesting example, the UK held uh, an OSI workshop on different environments and events other than underground. Uh, that was in November 2018. And it aimed to consider the possibility of conducting an on-site inspection in areas where there's been limited experience with testing. Environments other than underground, such as in different climate or geophysical environments, and in areas beyond the jurisdiction or control of any state, such as the high seas. So it became obvious to the 75 participants uh, that in areas such as the high seas, there is no inspected state party, and this introduces many legal aspects for the conduct of an OSI. For example, where would the base of operations be? On a ship, a port of um, embarkation, an airfield, or the PTS itself in Vienna? Where would be the point of entry? The fact that there is no inspected state party on the high seas means that there would be no liability issues and no state would limit the number of inspectors or even the use of autonomous underwater vehicles. These are all interesting things to think about anyway. <laughs> uh, moreover, the workshop participants realized that ocean currents could transport the evidence far away from the site in a short time. So one of the recommendations includes the possibility of a tabletop exercise that could address oceanic current circulation modeling and the effects of a nuclear explosion on the currents. Another recommendation suggested a tabletop exercise in a cold environment to consider the requirements to operate in frozen soil, what instruments can be used, what techniques are affected. In conclusion, the training program is designed to be applicable to training needs before and after entry into force. Further enhancement of the program will include support for capacity building, and training programs to ensure high quality station operators, collaboration with international and regional intergovernment organizations and academic institutions, and of course, promotion of the treaty in all aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you. We apologize for those of you who joined us uh, uh, the, for this talk uh, at, at the 1015 mark. We started a little bit early, but now you have an opportunity to ask questions. I think just one question or remark. Ooh. Sorry. Not fee. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lotfi from uh, uh, the PTS. Thank you very much for your uh, comprehensive report concerning the training and the capacity building. Uh, but I want perhaps to uh, know from you and uh, if you uh, would please uh, share with us your uh, uh, experience and uh, let's say uh, evaluation of the training cycle when you left it in the PTS many years ago and wh where it is now. So the status, the actual status, if you want. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, when I was here, it was really close to the beginning of the organization. So there were not a lot of training programs yet. The, the one that I remember more was the most, I should say, was the OSI training, which began at a fairly early stage. I'm not positive that that was the first area of training or not. And frankly, I didn't cover them that extensively myself. I've become interested in them more recently, and especially after the IFE experience that I went on, the exercise in, uh, in Jordan that I went on in 2014, and I realized how far the organization had come. It was pretty amazing. 
Um, but I cannot really speak to the NDC training and the IDC training per se, other than I know that it's come a very long way. It's developed substantially. Okay. Any other? Yes, in the back. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this presentation. It's not really a question, it's more like a comment. I was at the first NDC training in French in Madagascar uh, last month, and I can assure you that it was very beneficial for, pe for the participants. It, you know, uh, many people speak, the, uh, speak English, but it is not their mother tongue, and the, 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 sometimes they, don't, they, they will miss the details and so on. So, so it, it was great. So, uh, just to mention uh, that it should be encouraged in the future. Yeah, I, th I think I agree with that. As I mentioned, the, uh, there have been regional training programs in French, Spanish, and Arabic. And as I said, there's one coming up in Spanish, I think in 2021. Uh, so I agree, it's, a, it's quite valuable for, for people who, whose English is not. A lot of scientists don't necessarily focus on English as much as their science. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just a remark that uh, me, I'm the head, the chief of the CBT, but uh, I don't not aware about that uh, in 2021 there will be a Spanish uh, in this training. Well, that's what I read. <laughs> it's long, but uh, I don't know that. <laughs> that's the first time that I hear that. Well, the, 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 I have the, we plan to have one Arabic next year, but uh, Spanish, uh, I'm not aware about this. Well, I'm sorry, I read it, I read it in your materials, so <laughs> I'll find it for you. <laughs> and then the, the calendar is not out, uh, and that's uh, okay. Thank you for informing me. Well, if I'm wrong, I apologize, but this is what I read. <laughs> There's one more question. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, then, is there any information about uh, the possibility of uh, training in the other United Nations languages, uh, Russian and Chinese? Russian, there is, but not Chinese so far. Russian, we started to have that uh, since uh, 2012, uh, uh, yes, in Dubna. Yeah, but Chinese not yet. They don't request it, because for the French, they requested to have that. It was requested by in front of the working group last year, and then that we plan to have that. Spanish not. The, uh, this year, remember that at the beginning of the year, the, no, no, last year also at the end, the, the second uh, working group B, the Arabic requested to have that for next year. That's why that we had, it, it was planned. But so sorry for Spanish, I, I'm not aware. <laughs> and I have find one it for you. small announcement. Regarding the training, I heard that as of tomorrow, there will be a video released uh, showing the details of how training is conducted. So if you have interest, you can send an email, or you can see it tomorrow, one of the sessions, but if you can, uh, cannot attend, you can send an email to ctbto.library at ctbto.org and ask for a link. You can have a video. You can watch that. That's great. If I could make one possible suggestion, maybe you've already done this, maybe you could reach out to the youth group because there are quite a number of them who are involved in sciences. They might be interested in, in taking your training courses. Okay, with that, we'll close our session. Let's thank our speaker again. There is another session starting at 10.30 here, so we will, yeah, we will uh, make that happen. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Right here. You were the secretary at the You were the CTO?
Okay, good. Jen be in touch. Jennifer is not a double M, but just no, a one M. What parents, is that? My parents didn't know how to spell. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, even better. Uh, good morning, everyone. So we have uh, a long session today, data analysis algorithms, artificial intelligence, big data and deep learning. It's so many different issues we cover just for, uh, I think it's 14 presentations uh, during this day. And uh, we have know our uh, leader, Carl Moose, mm -hmm. and we have to run this session uh, together with uh, Abdul Hakim Gedu, and my name is Ivan Kitov. And we start with a presentation devoted to radionuclides. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone. So we start right away with the first uh, talk on radionuclide. And this is uh, by our colleague, uh, Guillaume. And the topic is on methodology to establish uh, Bayesian detection limits for radionuclide monitoring. Keeping in mind that this is uh, actually one of the uh, uh, outstanding issues in the, in the area of radionuclide uh, analysis. Thanks a lot and uh, hello everybody. I apologize for not being able to give my talk uh, standing. So the subject is a methodology to establish Bayesian detection limit for radionuclide monitoring. So we want to find when you have a signal among uh, a background noise. So we consider the situation where we have a baseline, I call that a baseline, it can be a blank a background noise, with a, something without any signal, and we measure a sample where a radionuclide might be present. The decision that a radionuclide is present, is usu usually made using a frequentist hypothesis test, f uh, first made by Curie in 1968. I would make an important uh, note, is that you can have several hypothesis tests. The Curie test is one among many possible tests. It is not the hypothesis test even if it's the one that is uh, most uh, often used. In fact, several authors advocate the use of credible intervals as an hypothesis test. I just um, put this citation of uh, Boldstad in his uh, book. So if nu zero lies inside the credible inter interval, we conclude that mu zero has credibility 
as a possible value. In that case, we will not reject the null hypothesis. So, if um, a result is significant, if we can reject the null hypothesis of zero value of the parameter, more simply, if zero is in the credible interval, it is a plausible value, it is an hypothesis test. To put it in a more, uh, to give a, a more comprehensive picture, you have a baseline. The baseline is known. You have a growth signal, which is known. The growth, the growth signal is a baseline plus an unknown signal. What you want to do is to, in fact, deconvolve the signal from the growth signal, knowing the baseline. So this is, uh, if we, the ideal uh, situation. We are looking for the signal and we are have uh, to deconvolve the gross uh, distribution. But let's imagine that you have the baseline and you try to subtract the baseline. You deconvolve the baseline from the baseline. What would you have? That means that you would have a signal of mean zero and of standard error twice uh, of the variance, twice the variance of uh, the baseline signal. And you can have negative values. So in a credible interval, if you had only the baseline, you would get negative uh, value. And you have to have negative value, otherwise it would never have a mean of zero, except if you have perfect knowledge and no uncertainty, that is a direct peak. So negative value comes from the uncertainty of the exact position of the baseline. Now, and the operation to do this is a, a, called a cross correlation. Now imagine that we have a growth signal where there is a, a growth uh, distribution where there is a positive signal. This is a convolution of, of a baseline plus a signal. And then you subtract in a deconvolution way the baseline. What would you get? You would get a distribution of the value that will have a mean, the, the those of the signal, and a standard error given uh, here, but you can have negative values you, of, the grow, of the net signal. Even with a perfectly positive value for the signal, with a deconvolution, you will have negative, po possible negative values because you have uncertainty of the baseline. It doesn't mean that radioactivity is negative, it means that the difference between the growth and the baseline, so the net value, uh, can be negative. It includes the net signal, but it includes also the uncertainty on the baseline. So excluding this negative value is a mistake. And this is what is commonly done by uh, considering, by saying that radionuclide value, radioactivity shouldn't be negative. But in fact, by deconvolution, you have negative value because of the uncertainty on the baseline. So, the picture here is that you can have, if you determine the credible value, we uh, started from the fact that if you have zero in the credible value, uh, the result is not significant. So let's imagine, I don't know, is there a pointer? 
Leslie. is red, yes. So, <laughs> a result is not significant if the credible interval contains zero. Here you have the measurement, and here you have the parameter. As soon as you reach zero, as the credible interval reach zero, so for a certain value of measurement, uh, the decision threshold, you know you're not significant. And in fact, the upper value of the credible interval is simply the detection limit. It's the most, um, the biggest value that is still plausible uh, with a given measurement. So, in a way, the decision threshold is the lower limit of credible, is when is a measurement for which the lower limit of credibility interval reach zero. Sorry? We still have three minutes. Okay. So I will accelerate a bit. You can use the oh, yeah. So we made a control by simulation, and for this, we draw a sample from a Poisson distribution. From the Poisson distribution, we determine the decision threshold for two methods, Curie and the method that I advocate. And we compare the decision threshold to a sample drawn from the same Poisson distribution, and we do that one million times. So, in a sense, we use the noise to determine the decision threshold, and we test the same noise uh, to, to the... Um, to those decision thresholds, and it, so if you have some error of significant result, it's automatically a false positive. And normally, you should get the ideal false positive rate of uh, the confidence level. So, this is a simulation result with one million uh, samples, drawings. So, what you can see is that here, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm colorblind, but the upper curve is uh, the Curie limit, Curie decision threshold, and you see that normally this is a ratio of the uh, false positive I real over um, ideal, it should be one, and the Curie test have uh, too much uh, false positive, it underestimates the decision threshold, and with the method of credible interval up to very low value of background noise, uh, we have a much better performance for decision threshold. So the, for the conclusion, the determination of the cred credible intervals provide enough information, one, first to determine if the result is significant or not, to know the decision threshold, the detection limit, and you can even provide an upper limit that will vary with the measurement result and not be uh, as a detection limit, a constant one. Interval est estimation is a, a form of uh, hypothesis testing and its performance is much better than the traditional query test. Okay, and as a side note, this can be uh, proven from a frequentist point of view by the Niemann person lemma. And uh, you, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have one minute for one question, including the answer. <laughs> so, is there any question first? Shabat, please. Yeah. Use microphone, please. How you calculate the baseline? Either it's from background or you have a specific algorithm and this is called, uh, always the same or uh, how do you calculate the error inside the baseline itself? Because you're assuming that the baseline in the, in the, sample, in the signal itself is similar to what you have in, in the calculated one. Yes, I do suppose that the baseline is the same, and uh, uh, it's a given distribution that is supposed to be known at least in an overall way. 
So, for example, a Gaussian, but it can be done. This is why I, I um, um, gave, gave the title as a, a methodology, is that you can use any uh, uh, background distribution that you want, at least from a numerical point of view. But it, you can also calculate it for uh, large uh, numbers of uh, distributions. Yeah. Thank you again. So we move ahead with the second talk. This is by Mohamed Maiza. The topic is on peak identification in EDS measurements using multiple subset sum problem formulation. Uh, thank you, sir. Everybody, good morning. I'm uh, Mohamed Maiza. Uh, teacher and uh, uh, researcher in the field of uh, computer science uh, operation research and optimization from uh, me Polytechnic School of Algiers in Algeria. And in this talk, I will present an idea to solving a problem of peak identification by the uses of uh, multiple, uh, multiple subsets and problem formulation. For this, uh, we have to uh, follow this plan. Uh, we beginning by, by the context of, uh, of the problem, and we introduce, uh, after that, the subset sum problem uh, together with a gamma spectrometry, and uh, we define exactly the problem of analyst uh, of an associated peak with a radionuclide, uh, and after that, we uh, uh, we present uh, the, the, uh, the solution of the peak identification problem or the formulation for this problem. Uh, any uh, physical occurrence that, uh, that is registered by the international monitoring system is called by an event, by CTBT. Uh, this event is uh, used, uh, an event is a help, a help uh, members, states to make a final judgment uh, for a natural or man-made event or earthquake or an explosion event or chemical or chemical of nuclear explosion. The, as already now, uh, the IMS uh, International Monitoring System contains 337 facilities and among all we have a radionuclide uh, and a radionuclide laboratory. We are, interest, uh, we, are, uh, we are interested much more in this work for the radionuclide and radionuclide laboratory. <coughs> to identify uh, the location of any event and quality it, uh, we use generally the waveform data. However, they cannot reliably answer the question as to whether a main-made event, such as an explosion, was nuclear or not. The only reliable way to answer this question is to raise and analyze the radioclive remains for a potential nuclear explosion. Uh, some, some remains provide the ultimate proof for the nuclear nature or of an event, and radioclive monitoring data from uh, 80 radionuclide monitoring stations worldwide are expected to shed light on this question. Uh, in this work, uh, or in our idea, uh, is used after the automatic analysis process, where analysts refine the results during interactive review. Because uh, only uh, the analyst of radionuclide data can provide the ultimate proof to establish nuclear nature of an explosion. Each radionuclide particulate monitoring station sends one gamma ray spectrum per day showing which radionuclide were observed in a single sample and in what quantity. Each radionuclide sample was examined and categorized in the corresponding group according to the nature of the radionuclide contained in them. In the spectrum analysis process, 
depth about the existence of level 4 or level 5 nuclide are made. And in order to answer that suspect nuclide exists or not, this presentation or this talk addresses the problem of association of an adulterated peak with a suspect nuclide. Uh, and we assume in this uh, work that uh, the corresponding energy is the sum of energies provided by the suspect nuclide. We use the formulation of the subset sum problem to, uh, to, uh, to this question. This problem is the well-known problem uh, of uh, combinatorial optimization. Uh, it consists to determine if there is some subset of number in an array that can sum up to some number s. Then, uh, the, uh, the subset sum problem is to find the subset of elements that are selected from a given set s was some added adds uh, up uh, to a given number k, where we consider that the set s contains no negative number. Uh, formulation, uh, we, have, uh, we have an array A of n elements, and we have uh, also a positive integer called the sum. The question is, are we have a subset sum A prime in A that the sum of A prime in A equal to S, or equivalent. And we have in, uh, in the other side, the vector X of an element of Boolean element, which correspond to each element of A, as selected or no. If a solution is desired, the problem becomes a functional problem. For example, we have a vector A, and we have S equal to 53. The solution of this problem is the vector X, which corresponds of the first to the second, and the uh, uh, near last, uh, element where the, the, the sum is equal to 53. But generally, there may exist several solutions of this problem. This is why this problem is a combinatorial problem. The SSP then is uh, MP hard problem and MP-complete decision problem. Uh, this, uh, uh, the algorithm is uh, computing the sum of uh, two exponential and different vector for, 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 uh, for, uh, for find the solution. One of uh, algorithm, uh, uh, efficient algorithm used to solve this problem, we have meet in um, the middle algorithm. This algorithm uh, need uh, more uh, place of memory. Uh, use dynamic, uh, this is, uh, in this slide we have uh, the algorithm uh, of meeting the middle algorithm. Uh, we introduce also the gamma spectrometry where we have most radioactive source produce gamma rays, which are of various energies and intensities. When these emissions are detected and analyzed with spectrometry system, a gamma ray energy spectrum can be produced. The gamma spectrometry is one of the fundamental measuring techniques in nuclear technology for an ambiguous clear identification of radionuclide, even in mixtures of various isotopes. The experiment is intended to show the basic of the methodology of gamma spectrometry, the properties of most important gamma detector, and how to identify clearly radionuclide. Moreover, 
The absolute activity of radionuclide could be determined by means of a gamma spectrometer if it is calibrated absolutely with regards to its efficiency. We have in this slide uh, uh, the main uh, function of uh, analysis uh, uh, of IDC or NDC analyst, where the analysis of the identity of gamma emitting radionuclides and measurement of their respective activity are the important task. Uh, in this slide, we have uh, uh, an example of uh, gamma emitter uh, 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 where we have uh, uh, for each uh, for each energy the count of uh, n the, the number of uh, detection in this uh, in this uh, resolution of uh, or, or in this detection we have some nuclide are detected but we have also, uh, no, uh, some uh, energy are not uh, are not associated with nuclide. This is an example for uh, spectra. And uh, we have uh, also uh, software to uh, to uh, interactive review. Uh, among uh, of we have open spectra or inspire in uh, the objective our objective is to performs better the identified peak the percentage of identified peak where some of peak are sometimes not identified for this we associate any peak with radionuclide one of mine uh, one, one of main analyst task is to affect the correct nuclei to the corresponding value of energy. This task allows the precise identification and quantification of the element. Some of peaks which corresponding to a given value of energy are sometimes not identified, and the no, uh, no, the no identification is due to the fact that the corresponding energy does not correspond to any classified nuclide. In order to identify such a peak and associate it with one or more radionuclide, we apply a formulation of subset sum problem. From already detected radionuclide and the set of suspect radionuclide, what are the, uh, the question is, what are the radionuclide was energy accumulation correspond to the energy of the uh, an, an unidentified peak? To solve this problem, we use the subset sum problem, where the in input we have the vector which contains energy value of all existing radionuclides together with energy value of sub, subsect, su, suspect radionuclide. And we have the energy of the radio, uh, of an identified peak. In the output, we have the set of energy value selected which correspond to the radionuclide detected. We use the formulation, and uh, after that, we have the identification of the peak uh, which corresponds to the sum of energy of, radi uh, of radionuclide not detected. We use this formulation, uh, the objective function, and the sum of uh, constants. And we have many approach resolution to solve this problem. We can use one of, of them. In summary, uh, we have uh, the, the subset sum problem formulation for the problem of assignment of, of radionuclide uh, to any peak without accordance energy radionuclide. And our idea allows the analyst to reduce the number of unidentified peaks. This uh, formulation can be solved in polynomial or pseudo-polynomial pseudo times for small instances, which, which is the case generally in uh, in uh, the spectrometry. The SSP formulation is very effective for testing the existence of such radionuclide which have several levels of energy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mohammed.
So it's time for coffee break, but uh, by then maybe you may want to ask one or two questions. Uh, I have a short announcement. So because we have some misunderstanding when the poster should be presented for uh, the session 3-5. It's uh, Thursday from 16.30 to 18.15. So the posters, the offers should be presented uh, in the area. And this is fixed now by organizers. And I will repeat it a few times because the audience will change, I think. Thank you. Uh, coffee break. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's important because people. Yeah.